morning, everyone. We're so glad that you've joined us this evening. Uh, welcome um, to our third session. Uh, just as a quick reminder, some of the, um, the chat features and the Zoom features that we are all very aware of now um, are on this screen for you to just take a look at. Uh, my name is Natalie Fikach, and I work for the South Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center as the school mental health lead. And again, want to say welcome to session three of the Creating Supportive Environments for LGBTQ I2 plus students and staff in schools. Uh, this is session three of a four part series, and we're going to talk tonight about gender affirming support practices in schools and how to support students, school communities, families, and school staff. And as a disclaimer, um, this presentation was prepared by us at the South Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center under a cooperative agreement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services, Services Administration, or SAMHSA. Please continue to read this uh, information on this screen, just because we're so excited about the content for this evening and want to be sure um, that all of you have your questions answered. In order to limit background noise while anyone's speaking, we have automatically muted your Zoom connection. Please note you can come um, on and off a of video. And if at any point you have a question for the group, just please put that in the chat box. Um, I will introduce our, our session facilitator, Shane Wally, see here, here's in just a moment um, to get us started. Today's webinar is brought to you by the South Southwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. And we provide a free training and ongoing consultation to the diverse array of professionals that support individuals with mental health challenges across our five state region, which you'll see highlighted in purple on this map. Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Louisiana, Arkansas, and several tribal communities. The Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, or MHTTC for short, is a project of the Texas Institute for Excellence in Mental Health, which is housed at the Steve Hicks School of Social Work at the University of Texas at Austin. Austin. This is our amazing team um, who have all contributed to making this event possible. I think I can genuinely, genuinely speak for our team when I say we're genuinely humbled to be able to provide this space for this critical topic which has faced, uh, which our workforce as well has faced drastic changes and challenges in supporting and serving our communities this school year. Before we introduce our speaker, I would like to just go over a few of our, um, we would invite everyone to engage in practice holding a learning space that is reflective of these principles. I'd like to read these because I know some of you are calling from your phone and are unable to see. So we, uh, we use affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all activities. That language is strengths-based and hopeful, inclusive and accepting of diverse cultures, genders, perspectives, and experiences, healing-centered and trauma-responsive, inviting to an individuals participating in their own journeys, person-first and free of labels, non-judgmental and avoiding assumptions, respectful, clear, and understandable, and consistent with our actions, policies, and products. So welcome to this event. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker, Shane Wally, Z here, hears, and I'm gonna turn it over to here uh, to get us started. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm so grateful to be here. Um, I have the good fortune of, of moderating the panel and the conversation. So we'd like to start with some introductions. Uh, so again, my name is Shane Wally. My pronouns are Z here and here's. Um, I uh, teach at the Steve Hicks School of Social Work. I'm an adjunct faculty member. I also um, have a small consulting firm called Daring Dialogues Consulting. Uh, one of the things that we're going to uh, share in our introductions, a reminder to the panelists, um, is uh, the lands that we're on. So I'm on the Comanche and Tunkawa lands here in Austin, Texas. And then the last question is um, something that brings you joy for working with LGBT youth. 
which I unfortunately am not doing at the moment, although I have LGBT folks in my in my class that I'm teaching. Um, and I think for me, it uh, keeps me honest with what's going on in the world, right? Like I can get in my gray headedness or been out for a really long time. Um, and when I work with the youth, it really uh, kind of centers and grounds me on um, what is current and happening. And it also, uh, the youth keep me honest around the work that I'm still needing to do um, around all things justice oriented, right? I'm going to just I'm going to pass it in the order that you all are on my screen. So that goes to you, Frederick. Howdy, y'all. I'm Frederick. My pronouns are they, them in English and AA in Spanish. Um, I am Out Youth's Advocacy and Education Manager, and I oversee the Texas Gender and Sexuality Alliance Network. Um, so I definitely see some familiar names in the uh, in the crowd. So I'm excited to have you all here. Um, I am coming to you from Comanche, Tonkawa, Jumanos, Lipan Apache, and Coahuilte Conland, otherwise known as Austin, Texas. Um, and something that brings me joy about working with LGBTQ youth is just their sheer resilience. Like they're so fierce and like never back down and it's amazing and so energizing and needed. So super grateful for that. <laughs> Kanoa. Hi, y'all. Uh, my name is Kanoa uh, Arteaga, um, and my pronouns are he and they. Um, I work during the daytime, <laughs> during my paid time, as the program manager um, at, uh, for the microgrants program at um, Trans Lifeline. Um, when I'm not doing that, um, I run an uh, online social media account called Abundant Masculinities that is really at its heart, um, an educational project um, that seeks to resource, um, especially uh, transmasculine folks and, and men um, with resources to unlearn and um, find alternatives and healing to toxic masculinity. Um, so I've done a lot of work with um, LGBTQ youth, especially LGBTQ foster youth. Um, I'm also um, based in Austin, Texas. So um, you know, home to the Tonkawa, the, the Comanche, the Humanos, and the um, Kualutecan uh, people, amongst many other tribes that um, we, we don't know and can't name today um, because their histories have been purposefully, intentionally erased, right? Um, I think, like, one of the things that I really enjoy about working with LGBTQ youth is that, um, you know, I think that their stories often get told in a very sort of like tra traumatizing or trauma focused kind of way. But I think actually they're they're moving through a time of deep exploration, deep possibility, um, and they have so much to teach us about um, just all of the possibilities that, that live in the exploration of gender. I feel like I, I have learned the most about myself and my relationship to my gender, um, being in relationship to um, queer and trans young folks. And I really appreciate that. Hendrix, you're up. Hesha, hello everybody, Hendrix, Henny, child, chafkados. My name is Hendrix, or I also go by Henny for short. I use they, them pronouns. Um, I am calling from Ogapoge Winge, also, um, known in English as Unceded Tewaland, colonially known as Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, I work with the New Mexico Genders and Sexualities Alliance Network um, as a program coordinator. I've worked with this organization in some capacity since 2016, first as a, as a youth volunteer, as a youth organizer, and now as staff. So grateful to be here. Um, and there are many things that bring me joy about working with LGBTQ plus young people. Um, a part of it uh, is just feeling the honor that it is to have, have a connection with um, young folks like me. So like being in a spot where, you know, when I was a young queer trans person, wishing that I had adult people to, um, seek out for mentorship and advice or just like have a place to vent and knowing that I'm honored to be in a 
place where I can try and provide that to people in my community, I think is really cool. I think what Kanoa said is really significant about like them helping me unlearn all of the, the biases that were trained into me, like other people were growing up, I think is really freeing. And, you know, on a lighter note, like they have such great taste in music, gotta tell you keeps me updated on the memes and keeps me humble in the like silliest the best way possible thank you paul gonna round us out my friend hi good evening i'm paul kretschmer i use the he him pronouns i'm coming to you from mainer texas which is um native lands for tonkua lipan apache humanos and kohiwiltikan and i hope i didn't butcher that sorry um and my day job, I am the art administrator for Austin ISD. And then in my entire life job, I'm on the board with GLSEN and uh, many things LGBTQIA 2S plus for the district and the wider world. Um, and what brings me joy about working with students is just, just the, the reality that they live where the world is in a much better place than when I was a student in that same condition. So it's it's just amazing to me how strong and outspoken and vital and just wonderful all the all the students are and that that we are building a space where they feel safe and being their true selves. Great. Thank you, y'all. Um so the way we're gonna uh, hopefully wrangle our time, which will not be enough, let's just be super honest right up front, um, is that we've got a couple of um, buckets of conversation. And again, we're gonna do our, I'm gonna do, I'm not gonna say we, it's gonna be on me. We're, I'm gonna do my best to leave a tiny bit of time at the end for questions and answers. So if you have questions as we go, uh, please leave them uh, in the chat and we will we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. And then the, the next panel, the last in the series, is really going to be almost all questions and answers with very little kind of buckets. So this is going to be more conversation. And the last one is going to be more questions and answers. So this is really just to entice you to come back to the fourth in the series. So the first bucket we have is going to be about intersectionality, right? None of us show up in any space with just a single identity. Um, and our leads in this conversation are going to be Kanoa and Hendricks. And the first question I have for you all is, I think we often have these conversations thinking and talking about more urban areas. And so I want to make space to have some conversation about how we support students in small, rural, um, and on Native American and Indigenous lands. And I will let you uh, fight for who's going to go first. I'm going to let Hendrix take this one. <laughs> cool. Um, so obviously it's, it's kind of a big thing to talk about. So I'll just note some things that are from my experience because that's what I have. So as a person who, you know, in New Mexico, we have our organization works statewide. So there are parts of our state that are just maybe more hubs or just have more close access to a lot of resources that are within our state in terms of queer trans plus support and particularly youth support. So that'd be places like Santa Fe where I'm at, Albuquerque and Cruces. And they're kind of in this like central line within the state, but we do statewide work. So we've also gone to other um, like farther reaches of the state, mostly through in-person travel, which I know has been a very um, interesting, silly thing the past couple of years. Uh, but as a person who's done that work for the past couple of years in this organization and somebody who comes from kind of a more rural area um, in Oklahoma is I think the biggest thing is um, on, on our part as somebody who wants to be a supportive person, finding ways to be involved in community um, without having to be asked first. So something that we've done as well as, you know, 
for Pride season, for example, we're not just going to events in Santa Fe and Albuquerque. If there's a Pride in a small town like Roswell, or if there's um, Gallup and Taos Pride that are maybe in more um, northern regions, closer to more of our rural and um, indigenous population, indigenous communities in our state, finding ways to connect very intentionally in a way that you know shows folks that you know we're not just waiting for people to ask help because you know being a part of community, we know where people need help, right? We just a lot of us just don't know what resources are out there yet. So the broadest answer that I'll have for right now, uh, just because I want to give Kanoa some space too, is um, just making sure we're doing the best of our ability to make sure we're known. Um, and that includes um, finding people too, not just letting them find us. Yeah, that's super real. Thank you, Hendrix, for that. Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I think that like, I want to say that my area of expertise doesn't um, live with, um, you know, indigenous and uh, communities in uh, the um, continental US. My um, family is from Hawaii. Um, and that's where a lot of my connections live. I think one of the things that I really love about um, you know, coming from uh, a lineage of indigenous people is that um, we have very um, extensive oral traditions and histories, right? And um, what's really great about that is that it's a massive resource, right? So, um, you know, I can go to my, my grandparents and I can ask for, tell me about, um, you know, all of the men in our family who help out with dishes or who have traditionally disrupted um, gender norms and the way that they play, play out in our families and they have access to that information. And so when we're, and, you know, when we're thinking about um, how um, indigenous peoples have um, really, you know, been the, the trailblazers for um, thinking about gender more expansively and thinking about having access to those histories, um, they're there. And um, having this invitation to like, search our lineages for evidence of gender expansion, for evidence of queer people, for evidence that like trans people have always existed, right? Um, all of that is there and just takes a little bit of digging. Um, you know, the language that my grandparents use probably will be very different than the language that like young people today are using to talk about their, their gender and their gender expression and that that's okay and that part takes a little bit of navigating but being able to at least like identify it um, and being being invited to to search through the archives and search through the lineage um, a little bit is I think a really wonderful part of having access to that history. I'm just going to add a teeny bit of apologies but I I just I often hear people say and it happened a lot in the It Gets Better campaign, which is old now, but like people who live in small towns and rural areas just need to move to big cities, which are safer. And I think we really have to unwind that and make smaller towns and rural areas safe instead of saying like the only option you have is to leave wherever is home, right, to be able to be safe. So just the answer is not migration, right? The answer is or peace. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I'm going to throw this one to you first, which is um, what what are some practices that uh, can really support people being able to bring their their full selves, right? That they can bring um, their gender identity and sexual orientation, and right, all the other identities that they have. Which I know for a lot of people, they those spaces aren't always easy to find. Sure, I mean, I think that, um, you know, what this sort of like reminds me of is, um, is the, the term like world building when we're talking about um, movies and, and media creation, right? Like, um, you know, the connection that happens between two people where, um, it is one that is found really deeply founded in trust, right? And for me, trust is something that's earned. It's not something that's assumed, right? And, and you know, when I think about trust, I think about the, the four components of trust. So like care, 
sincerity, competence, reliability. When we have those things, um, that connection can be an incredibly protective force, right? And so when we think about all of the potentially scary things that young people, especially queer and trans young people have to navigate, um, having protective forces um, in, in their lives is a, a really great way to know that you know, no matter what they are experiencing, they're gonna be okay, right? Like they, they have this reasonable reassurance that like they're gonna make it out on the other side, okay. And so I think about, um, you know, when I'm thinking about those, those practices, I think what comes up for me is, is being able to tell our young people, you know, I may not understand every single facet or dimension of um, the way that you experience your gender, in your body, the way that you experience your gender in the world, but I damn well am gonna respect it, right? Um, I don't have to understand it in order to respect it. Um, and, and, I, and I am pushing myself, I'm challenging myself to um, find those growing edges, to soften them, to like give sharpness to my lenses so that I can meet you where you're at, right? And I can mirror um, I think mirroring is also like a really great practice, right? Like using the language that young people use themselves to describe their, their gender and their gender experience. Um, because uh, I think what, what young queer and trans people are so good at doing is giving us handbooks for how to love them and giving us handbooks for how to support them, right? Um, and they, they are already giving us so many tools to, to know how to do that well. It's just a matter of, knowing what to listen for, right? And, and being able to, to hear it when that wisdom arrives at our door because it's arriving every day. Um, yeah, Hendrix, I'm curious, do you have anything to add to that? Totally. Um, and I just wanted to second that. I think it's so powerful for, um, for all of us, particularly if we're interacting with anybody where we happen to be um, a privilege in a certain dynamic to, to know that, um, you know, it's it's not about us when we're trying to support somebody whose experience we cannot relate to whatsoever, especially in the context of somebody with um, experiences of oppression that we don't have, is that we don't have to understand. Like our, our ego doesn't have to be mingled into it. That's where things get uh, a little sticky, a little messy. Some uh, harmful things can happen there. Um, the other thing that I'll note in terms of things that, um, just relate to supporting intersections is letting folks know that they exist. Um, I was very blessed at the beginning of my life to be raised on my mother's side. So I happened to be raised in a small town in Oklahoma, but being raised by in goth indigenous femmes, multiple queer people uh, of color in my life to, to role model after that had strong, um, values of boundaries and expectations and not um not kind of like creating an environment where everything has to be questioned if they don't look like what uh is shown on tv right um so a big thing is just finding any opportunity to um show our our colleagues our young people that we might work with that their experience is not um like it sounds so cheesy, like they're not alone as, as much as the world might teach them uh, or pressure them to feel that they are, right? So for every, you know, um, Ellen DeGeneres that they see on television, no shade to Ellen, well, no shade to Ellen DeGeneres, but are we also showing folks like um, Juan Gabriel? Are we showing folks like Ty Defoe, Audrey Lord? Um, Sylvester, to name a few. There's just so much um, that that is in the world that many of our young people are not uh, exposed to, either because maybe they're the only queer trans person in their household, maybe um, they are a person of color in a predominantly white school district, um, and there's just like not a lot of inclusive media because of the inherent like systemic um, racism that exists in the way of how we prioritize who's exposed in media and history and things like that. So that's something that 
at least in virtual support calls that I do with young people has been a really cool impact and has been a point of lots of really like um, inspiring or just interesting conversations is teaching people, yeah, there, there were many ways uh, that people portrayed, you know, what we call in English as like expansiveness or queerness um, throughout the centuries, right? I didn't know until I was an adult and met other two-spirit indigenous people um, about the, the vast history <laughs> of um, expansive gender roles, um, language and expression that traditionally existed in my communities. It was just information that had been intentionally erased by colonial powers. So, you know, I think at least in my experience that has been another really, really impactful thing is doing our best to educate ourselves about what's out there, but at the same time, making sure that we're giving that information to our young folks too, because you know, the more intersections that they might experience, um, of course, that that's um, because of systems of oppression, that's just more and more pressure that could make them feel like there's nobody that can relate, but there is, and there's really, there's power in, in finding your people. I love that. Thank you so much. Uh, I am going to move us gently forward. Um, so the next kind of topic that we're going to talk about, it's interesting because I think the affinity group piece um, is an interesting connection to some of the responses around the intersectionality piece. Um, so the question, and this is going uh, to Frederick and Hendrix, your seat stays warm for a little bit longer, right? Is how do you start LGBTQ affinity groups inside schools? And you can talk about maybe um, places where it, it uh, might be gentle and places where there might be resistance. Frederick, I'm gonna let you go first just to let Hendricks take a breath. Perfect. So Texas is huge and there are, there's a huge spectrum of what it's like for LGBTQ students in Texas when it comes to their um, experience in starting affinity groups for LGBTQ students um, at primarily white schools in urban areas. It tends to be pretty easy. Um, most of the time, the administration isn't going to give students any trouble, um, but the less of any of those things, white or urban, um, or wealthy a district is, the harder it's going to be. Um, out, you know, to the experience of students who can't find a teacher willing to be their sponsor for their club. And if you don't have a sponsor, you can't have a club. Um, schools legally cannot stop students in secondary um, education from having a GSA club, a Gender and Sexuality Alliance club, um, but that doesn't mean they don't try. Um, there are a number of things that we can do to handle that if and when that comes up. Um, but more than um, kind of running into those illegal roadblocks that administrators are trying to throw up, um, a lot of students just run into more logistical things. So for example, I am working with students out in Abilene who um, their administration has said like, yeah, sure, you can have a GSA if you can find a sponsor. And the teachers know that they're jobs would be on the line if they were the ones to put their name on the club and so the students can't find a sponsor and they can't have their club luckily libraries are amazing and so they're doing it at their local library um, but they should be able to do it in school i think one of the things that i learned from students in um, gsa's so every year the texas gsa network does a virtual educational symposium called q plus edu that was um, created by a um, black non-binary student in central texas and one of the panels that we did this past year was um, centering QT BIPOC, queer and trans, black, indigenous, and people of color students in your GSA club. Um, and I think the message that resonated the most with me as a person with immense white privilege is that creating something and then going in after the fact and saying, oh, we need to make it diverse now, like bring us your people of color, like that's never going to serve the people you're saying that you want to serve. 
if you want your, whatever you're doing to be able to serve those people you're saying that you're going to serve, they have to be involved in the beginning. They have to be involved in the planning and be able to tell you what they need and how you can serve them. Um, and the same is true for GSA clubs and affinity spaces on school campus. There's a reason that schools that even schools that are um, majority minority um, and have a minority white population that their GSA clubs are still majority white students. And that's because of the history of anti-blackness within the queer community and because of white supremacy and because there's so many different systems of oppression that run into each other in these spaces. Um, yeah, it's really complicated, but starting a GSA isn't. So if you're in Texas and you know a student who would like to start a GSA, definitely share my contact information with them or any teachers, I'm happy to help. Wanna follow that? <laughs> I, I know there's some cool people on this panel. Um, I, I, I think we've seen so far that I'm very prone to soapboxes, so I'll try not to do that. But um, the only thing that I'll really emphasize, I don't think I'm adding so much, is just emphasizing what they said about um, community collaboration from the start. This is a, a big thing that, you know, since I graduated being staff instead of a youth organizer um, in, in starting to help youth leaders start GSAs in their schools is really just having clear expectations um, for adult allies about what organizing with youth um, should be like. Um, so not just playing into the power dynamic of like, oh, we're adults, so we're more experienced, so we know how this is gonna go and it's gonna be all right. Um, it's, I think there's a lot of underestimating with young people's um, power of organizing and just their work that they do, the, the um, teachings that they give to people their age and older or younger. Um, so something that I talk about with when I work with um, the schools that I'm already connected to when I meet new schools is, um, okay, I wanna hear what the young folks are looking for first for the same things that Frederick was saying, because that, that was a beautiful thing that happened for um, the first um, organization that I, or the first GSA club that I had when I moved out here. We had an Indigenous Queers Plus club at my art college. Um, and that's exactly how it went. We just had a group of LGBTQ to Spirit Plus identified Native people in the school going like, hey, we want our own space to kind of just be queer and trans and two-spirit and native and all of these things and talk about all how complicated this all is. Um, and we we came as a coalition together before we even approached administration. And I know that's in a college setting and, and things are different. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of nuances in terms of, you know, community climate, which I think we'll talk about later too. Um, but really just emphasizing that it is um, a blessing to be a support role. Um, when it comes to uh, GSA clubs and that um, keywords being support. Um, when there needs to be guidance and mentorship, absolutely, um, that, that's a great place to be in. And you know, if there are any folks in New Mexico, I'm so down to, to contact you and work with you um, for that. But yeah, that would just be the only thing I'd add. Cool. Thank you. Appreciate uh, all the wisdom and the complexity, right? It isn't simple. And now we're going to just like shift half a bucket over, maybe. Um, and Paul, this is going to start with you. So just to give you a, a heads up. <laughs> and Hendrix is uh, still on the hot, still on the hot seat, right? So this is really thinking about those non-affirming schools. So maybe it's a school where they haven't been able to start a GSA, but they've got teachers who want to do the right thing, even though administration may not want to do the right thing. Um, so how do we, you know, how should one go about kind of supporting staff who want to support students in non-affirming environments? So I feel like for, for the way you're asking the question is like for big people to support staff that want to support students. 
And I think the, the first, a first good step for that is just to look at what your district or your area already has around anti-bullying and using that as a stepping stone to go from that broader picture to specific things that your student needs, that these students need. Um, I feel like that's sort of what happened with us in Austin ISD. Like every time we, we're we blessed in, in, to be in Austin. And so we have, and we have a large number even at our central office of folks in this community. And I think that's part of why we've grown in our ability to, to, to serve these students is because we have that structure, but, but all of the things that we have are linked back to, um, and I think for us, it sort of started even with no place for hate where like we look at the broader of umbrella of this is a form of bullying. Yes, these, you know, these students are bullied even more than traditional students and other reasons, but that's been a good starting place to, to sort of build a foundation for, for that care and support and building safe spaces for those, for those um, LGBTQ students. Hendrix. Yeah, so I know these are, these are kind of like big topics, right? So there's a couple of ways that we could answer this. Um, what came to mind for me is just some experiences that I've had with certain schools who, you know, I do have regular um, contact with, but they are not at the stage where they have a youth organization at the moment. Um, Cause I think there's, you know, there's unfortunately the reality where, um, you know, maybe there's a school where there are queer trans plus young people that could benefit from having a space. It's just for one reason or another, the, it doesn't feel like the safety is there for them to feel like they can have that space. So when I've come across things like that, the past couple of years I've had at this job is really working with um, the adults and finding ways that we can teach the adults in the school, the best ways that they can be in solidarity with their queer trans plus and um, uh, intersectionally marginalized young people in their school to make sure that they can help keep the young people safe. So we do things like um, safe zones trainings where we teach a school how to implement a program where there are designated and volunteer safe adults in the school for particularly marginalized students or uh, folks who are perceived to have certain marginalizations to have a safe space to get resources or to feel safe in general. Um, and in that we have things like um, an anti-oppression and intersectionality 101 class where we go over these really foundational um, terms and topics like what is um, imperialism and what is capitalism and patriarchy and white supremacy. Why is this relevant for us to go over for a training for school administration and staff? Um, because, you know, as, um, you know, as neat as I think it would be if we had just anti-oppression curriculum in our schools, uh, just as a form of practice, that's not the reality that most of us live in, I would think. Um, so trying to find ways where, you know, if there aren't allies or at least a lot of allies in a school yet trying to find ways where we can meet folks where they're at so that they can feel inclined to learn how to be in better solidarity with people that are not like them um because you know that's um one of the best ways that we've found to at some point create that barrier of safety where young people go oh yeah we do see you know for example if they do a safe zones program we are seeing like these safe zone signs we're seeing all these rainbow stickers and stuff everywhere like maybe there are adults where um that like won't um make me feel unsafe if i come out to them as queer or trans or um so on and so forth so that's what i would say about trying to meet people where their communities are at because safety is a very real um th thing to think about you know if there are not circumstances where a school where young people feel like they can have a GSA. Um, there are also, it's important to know if there are community resources out there to know 
what we can still give to young people. Because they're even if folks aren't out, even if the school doesn't have a GSA, at least for example, for New Mexico, there are organizations like mine where there's still resources that we could still try and possibly get to young people. We have ourselves virtual support calls um, every other week for queer trans plus and allied identified young people where you know we have um, really explicit boundaries about you know when we have reminders for these calls we won't say specifically that it's um, a, a call for a queer and trans plus young people because you know what if um, a family member sees it or a person in their household sees it that they're not, not out to and that creates a feeling of unsafety. Um, so finding resources and ways where we can get support to young people wherever they unfortunately have to be depending on their circumstances too. Um, as I think it's, you know, when we're talking about ways to make young people feel seen regardless of identity, I think it's important to include young people whose circumstances exist where they're not able to live out yet, unfortunately. Um, you know, because harm reduction is real. If if harm reduction can be an anti-oppression 101 for teachers and staff, that's great. If it's um, getting a list of queer trans plus musicians and influencers and memes to young people so they can feel some form of queer trans joy for a minute, that's great too. So just trying to find all of the little ways that that we can show our young people that um, they are being considered as it starts there is just making sure that they know that they're being seen and taken into consideration as a part of a community. Building those trusting relationships, being that authentic person that that those students can feel comfortable around, even like even if you're the only one on that campus, which I was when I was in the classroom, it's like, you know, be that be that beacon. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, I appreciate Hendrix. Uh, what you know. Um, so the other question, though, right, is we have focused a lot on youth, which I appreciate, and it's a large part of why we're here. And we have adults who want to do the right thing, and fear for their jobs, right, or fear for their credibility or promotion or raises, right, and so. Um, or not being hassled on the daily. So it, are there things that you all have seen or tried that also, um, right, like we uh, have a lot of mythology about kind of no promo homo laws in Texas and I'm sure other places. And so if we can uh, just talk about the, you know, like, uh, strategies for the for adults too um in how to uh like i want to think that everybody can be bold and fearless and uh rent is real and so right what are the strategies around helping uh, right helping adults feel better Frederick, do you want to chime in on this one a little bit, maybe? I think I saw you go off mute. I appreciate you. Yeah, you're like, I'm just going to go off mute. Um, yeah, so I think the number one thing is whatever privilege you have, you have a responsibility to use that. So if you are a white, straight, cis person with class privilege, it is your responsibility to use all of those privileges to share the mic and, you know, speak up and be the one to complain that your school's forms only say male and female, to be the one to complain that there are no black people in your history classes other than in February. Like if we as white people are the ones making these complaints, they're going to hear us way more than they're going to listen to anybody else. Um, it's a gross fact. Um, that said, there's a lot of things that we can do. Um, training, so uh, Out Youth created a training for K-12 staff in Texas, it's called Be a Beacon. It's a three-part training that um, covers all sorts of things, but one of the main pieces of it is what do the laws say about what teachers can and can't say in the classroom. It was recorded before our anti-critical um, race theory law passed through. Um, so we don't touch on that in the session specifically, but 
our no promo homo laws have been moot and unconstitutional since 2003 when the Supreme Court ruled in Lawrence v. Texas that Texas's anti-sodomy laws were unconstitutional. So um, you can say homo all you want. You might, well, maybe not, um, <laughs> but you can talk about gay things. It's okay. Uh, if you're teaching sex ed, that's the one area where it gets a little bit trickier, but there's strength in numbers. If you're not in your like union, join a union, join your teacher's union. Um, and we have good friends at the ACLU and Lambda Legal and the National Center for Lesbian Rights who are happy to file these lawsuits for us if and when school districts are being awful. Um, so if you have any questions about any of those things, definitely um, reach out to me but there's tons of training available. We're gonna share a bunch of resources later. Um, I know we're running out of time, but we're gonna share a bunch of resources later. Um, and a lot of that includes different kinds of professional development that you can find on different kinds of topics. Uh, Frederick, I'm just gonna ask you to stay there. Like that's where we are and we are, right? We are hitting close on time. So since you launched yourself beautifully, I'm just gonna let you Keep, keep going. Absolutely. And Kanoa, I appreciate you just like dropping links in the chat throughout, <laughs> throughout the conversation too. Um, so let me see. Anyone on the internet with this link can edit. Oh, that's not what we want. Um, Y'all can view it. Um, there we go. That's better. Um, so here are uh, some Texas y resources. Um, I love resources. Resources are my jam. And so if you go to um, the third link on there, it's called Finding Inclusive Professional Development. And that is um, the resource list from a session that I did for QPLUS EDU um, by the same name. And it has a um, huge list of websites for things like um, professional development, um, lesson plans, curricula, um, reading, stuff on race, um, anti-Semitism, um, gender and sexuality, police-free schools, uh, ableism and fat phobia, classism, and at least one other category. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, and we have a Google Drive with resources for other locations as well, but that's the Texas specific one. Paul, you're the other person I'm gonna give opportunities for resources, and then I'm actually gonna also open it for Hendricks and Kanoa, just in case you have things that haven't been talked about. Sure, and I and I have some things in that folder um, that I think they're going to share with everybody when you send the video out. But I'll put some links in the chat in just a moment. Um, what I was going to say is, it sort of goes back to the question you gave me earlier. When you're looking for like big impact for your for your adults to be able to help your children, whatever national or state groups that are doing that work that you can pair with, they can offer you resources and legal guidance. Um, the, the program that Frederick mentioned, that's actually in our professional learning catalog as a, a thing for teachers to get CPE credit for, for our entire district. And we're actually working as a, as our committee, we're working to try to make that become one of the mandatory trainings that teachers do every year when you come back in August, not just it's there if you want it, but to make that part of the standard. Um, so I am a board member with Glisten here in Austin. And again, Glisten is all about education. So there are a ton of resources there. And then um, the, I think one of the, I think I mentioned this, but also just like the No Place for Hate program, like that's a, a larger umbrella that comes down to building resources for, for our students. And then just, you know, finding members of your community, members on your school board, members in your administration that are part of that community or have children in that, in that, in that place. That's, that's an excellent starting point for, for growing something from nothing. Great, thank you, Paul. Hendrix, do you wanna add anything into the resource conversation? Absolutely. Um, I know it's super cool to, to hear about things that you don't have immediately, but will get in the future. But I'll try and um, not sell it because I'm uh, not, not, not going to make it capitalistic, but you know, some things that I will put in folders that you'll get eventually is there are some national resources that I've done. I can't remember if I said this already. I apologize if I already did. I'm a part of um, 
the National GSA Network's Two-Spirit Initiative. So I work in collaboration with other Two-Spirit identified people across different territories. And we're starting to come across, or you know, we're starting to create different resources um, to support specifically our native youth that also identify as queer trans plus. So I'm gonna put some PDFs and stuff in there. There's also a pamphlet on how to spot and um, take action when we spot white supremacy within schools. Um, there is um, a toolkit that I'll put in talking about ways we can integrate um, two-spirit perspectives into our communities. Um, there's handouts that young, pe young amazing people that I work with have made on pronouns and how to use pronouns and um, uh, um, trans 101, trans justice 101. So there's a couple of different things. And then for, there's um, folders divided by state. So for Oklahoma and New Mexico, I'll put a page that has links of folks you can find, organizations to know about, to look up, or organizations that you can um, ask for more resources that are specific to, to those locations as well. So that's what I got. And I will say also, don't be afraid to use your financial resources. Like there are businesses and other, like we were just become a benefactor from the Spurs for our stuff with Glisten because they wanted to support us. Um, there are, there, I'm putting a resource in the chat now. There's a national gay and lesbian chamber of commerce. So there may be powers that be within your areas that are on the business community that can help you either with resources or, you know, with your, growing your your community with your education side Ms. Paul Kanoa anything you want to add to the resource bin yeah I don't know if I have too much more to add to this conversation um, I know that lots of resources are flooding the chat and will be made available um, you know I just want to say that like uh, lots of organizations have gone out of their way to you know really make the case that there are just an overwhelming amount of, you know, psychosocial, you know, physiological, even like benefits to things like GSAs and more protective, um, inclusive school environments. Um, and so, you know, doesn't a principal love a graph? I mean, like <laughs> teachers just eat data up, right? And I, I'm telling you, like, Many people have gone out of their way to make those resources available and to like make that case for you. Um, so you don't have to reinvent the invent the wheel, right? Like th those those charts and those graphs are already out there. Um, it's just a matter of finding them. So I would really encourage you to to lean back on the data because it's all there. It's all there. there there's really an inarguable um, case for safer, more inclusive schools. Um, and then the other thing that I will say is that it's actually not that hard to like fold queer and trans people, historical figures, current figures into curriculum. I've done it before. Um, there are many, many opportunities um, to look at the intersections of um, queer and transness when it comes to math, science, literature, history, art. Like we've always been there. Um, and so just, you know, any opportunity you can to, to fold us in uh, and bring our stories into the classroom, I think is, um, yeah, a win. Absolutely. And Kanoa, I think you're totally right. I, it's one of the lessons I want to impart on people is you are already teaching about queer people. It's just that their queerness and their transness is being erased with the way the curriculum is written. And so making sure that when we're talking about um, Dr. Maya Angelou or Dr. Sally Ride were including the fact that they um, lived their lives in ways that would be considered under the LGBTQIA2 plus umbrella, despite the fact that we can't assign labels to them. Okay, my friends, we are uh, quickly coming to the end of our time. I've been watching the chat and I've seen some questions, but I've also seen you all drop in resources. This is your chance you have, we have just a couple of minutes. If there's a burning question you wanna make sure to ask, um, or you can just come back to session four. Hendrix, you have a question? Oh, well, I did, I'm sorry, I didn't wanna interrupt you. No, go I ahead, just, go ahead. I'm, I'm just giving you a hard time, go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, make sure that we don't miss, I believe, was it, 
um, there was already a question a bit earlier in the chat, but we hadn't gotten to get to it yet from Sir Isaac, how do we implement programs into the program we work for? So I'm curious if you want to either go on mic, no pressure, because that is not for everybody, or in chat if you wanted to specify the question about which programs specifically. I just want to make sure we don't gloss over questions that were already asked. I appreciate you. Thank you. I miss, I've been trying to keep one eye and I missed that one. So. Sure, thank you. I'll make it really, really quick. Um, but to clarify my question, I, I work for a nonprofit organization in which the program that I am assigned to, we have the age range for youth. Um, and of course, where there is any human, there is an LGBT community. And so um, coming in and wanting to implement this into the peer groups or implement it into the program as a facet um, in already a pro stabilized program, how do how would I go about integrating that in and working that into um, the program, you know, with the resources? And, and you dropped a lot of good resources in the track that I will go and look into. Um, but what would be some of the beginning stages that advice you would give me? Again, it's already a, a working program, but I want to that that's my kind of my goal. <laughs> so my goal is to is to go ahead and get that implemented um, as it is a need for it. So I just want to make sure I understand this isn't school specific. This is more uh, some other type of organization. Yes, I um I work for a mental health uh, I, I work for a mental health facility here in Tyler, Texas, um, and we work with ages fifteen to thirty. Oh, got it. Yeah, I um, I may pop in a little bit on this because um, mental health is a area that I uh, do work in a little bit and have done. Um, I think it's like uh, making sure that it is a topic that people are uh, feel free to talk about. That there is that your staff is trained. If you have peer support specialists, right? That they're trained. Um, and that if you have enough people who um, are LGBTQ identified that you can run support groups that are affinity support groups, uh, that is super helpful. Um, I, you can feel free to reach out to me and I'm really happy to continue having this conversation and can give you some other resources um, around that. So I will put, I will, uh, put my uh, email in the chat. Thank you so much, um, Shane, Frederick, Kanoa, Hendricks, and Paul for sharing all these great resources and, and part of your journey and, and just ways that we can better support um, students and staff who identify as LGBTQ. Um, thank you all for being here this evening.